come to you this morning, opening our parched places to receive the streams of living water you offer to us. Most of the time, most of us don't even know we are thirsty. We don't know the deep dehydration that scours our bones and parches our hearts. Sometimes when our thirst pangs emerge, we draw from the enticing wells of the world's offering of power and profit, which leaves us even more empty. Still us, God, so we might listen to you speaking to us, knowing us, seeing us, loving us. Fill us with your living water that will transform our spirits and souls into springs that burst forth with life and love for your people, for ourselves, and for our world. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
you've now got the blood flowing, we've been our layup lines and shooting rounds, we'll have you ready to go. Now we're here to tip off. That's the way I explain it. So here now, friends, is our, our call to worship. We lift up our souls to you, holy God. We trust the Lord with our past, present, and future. Teach us, Lord, that we might know your ways.
our forgetfulness. We confront today our waywardness. We accept, Lord, that we are sinners. To turn to our past is to recall both your great acts of love and kindness as well as many moments and situations where we know we failed you. Even still, your love remains. And so in humility and brokenness, we pray. We ask you to forgive. We ask, Lord, that you would heal. Buy us back, Lord. Redeem us from our slavery to ourselves and our own way. Crown us again with your acceptance and care. Satisfy the real thirst of our soul. Renew us with the strength that only you can give. Reveal yourself to us again as a God of grace, rich in mercy, patient with our wandering. As far as the rising sun is from the setting sun, remove our sin from us. Today, Lord, and together, Lord, we declare our affection, our adoration, and our praise for you. In the holy and loving name of Jesus, we pray. Sisters and brothers, I want you to hear this good news. That Christ died for each and every one of us while we were yet sinners, proving God's love for us. In the name of Christ Jesus, friends, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. I want to invite you now, sisters and brothers, to, to join me as we, with one voice, make our statement of faith, make our confession of faith. We state those things that we believe in our hearts, those things that make us different from the rest of the world. Saying those things as contained in our Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax 
collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe it. Friends, again, this is the word of God for you and I, the children of God. The thing I think is funny is that regardless of where you grew up or even when you grew up, we have certain phrases in America that everybody seems to know that seems to be just a normal part of our everyday language. For instance, if I were to say to you, see you later, alligator, how would you respond? After a lot of crocodiles. We all know what this means. You're saying goodbye to a person or a group of people with the intended purpose that I'm going to see you again at some time in the future. What time? Later. Now, later could be a few hours, it could be a few days. It's indeterminate. But in exchange of those phrases, the specifics of that time are not very important. It's just later, right? Kind of like when we get that honey new list, right, fellas? <laughs> when are you going to do it? Later. I still got to paint the laundry room. That's going to list. It's 2017. Uh, one day I'll get to <laughs> But friends, this morning I want to stress to you just how important that word really is when it comes to our faith journey. Later. It's an important word in the passage we just read, particularly the passage of the parable of the two sons. And it's an important word as we consider our lives. Yes, yeah, certainly it means at a time indeterminate in the future. But this morning, friends, I want to ask you, what will you do later with the word of God that has been given to you? I mean, after all, that's what we're being asked as we read this parable of the two sons in Matthew chapter 21, aren't we? In this parable, we have two very different layers. We have one layer that is good, and we have another layer that is not so good. As a father, he has two sons. Truthfully, something about these boys, each of them reminds me a little bit of myself when I was younger. As you reflect on this parable, maybe it reminds you of how you acted as a, as a young person. If you're a father or mother, it may remind you of your own children as you read through this parable. But Jesus gives us a picture of a father who asks his sons to complete a fairly simple task. Go work in the vineyard. When the father comes to the first son, that first son is defiant. He's obstinate. They even say he's a little bit rude. He talks back to his dad. He says to his father, I will not. You may be imagining him say, I don't want to. Or I don't feel like it. But later, this son has a change of heart. Maybe he knew he was being difficult and he was being despicable. But maybe he knew he was resisting the will of his father. Maybe he knew that he was being rebellious. Maybe he knew that he was questioning the very authority of his father. His father knew all this as well. But later, this son repents. And he goes into the vineyard and does the work of his father. Now, as much as we may not like that first son the way that he behaved, I think the second son is even worse. Because he says, What? Yeah, I'm going to do it. He even calls his father, Sir. Yes, sir. I'll go right out and do it. That reminds me of some. Southern matter is we'll smile at somebody, but through our teeth we're saying something they not so not so kind. <laughs> Reminds me of back then when I was a child and mom won't be to do chores. And she would ask again and again and again and again. And so to get her to stop pestering me, I would tell her, yes, I'll do it. But I had no intention of doing it. <laughs> I wanted to play outside some more. I wanted to shoot more shoot more baskets. I go around the bike with Buy myself a little time. The reality of what I was doing was questioning her authority, not in her face, not her face, but in my heart, not my actions. Might even say such behavior may be a hypocrite, or a liar, or a deceiver. 
and nasty, later regretted it, and later changed his mind, and later did the will of the Father. And Jesus makes clear to his audience exactly what this parable means. See, Jesus is in the courts of the temple, teaching the people when the religious leaders come in to question the source of Jesus' authority. Now, if we go back a little bit in the Gospel of Matthew, what we find out is this, this event actually takes place during Holy Week. And it takes place from the day after Jesus has come into the temple and done some pretty bold things. He flipped the tables over of the money changers because they were not honoring God in the temple. And then he comes back the next day and starts teaching in the temple without the authority or permission of the temple leaders. And these religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were not happy. These Pharisees and Sadducees, you may remember, are the highly religious people who held everybody to impossible standards except themselves. They were the ones who made themselves look more holy, more godly, more religious, more righteous, more pious, more important, more spiritual, more privileged than they really were. I mean, if you go back a few years before this, in Matthew chapter 3, they go to see this crazy prophet named John the Baptist. And John the Baptist spoke against them for thinking that they were automatically privileged to be called sons of Abraham, that they felt themselves to be the chosen people of God. John the Baptist knew that the real chosen people of God, the ones who are the real and true children of God, are those who walk in a manner worthy of God. But these religious leaders were like the second son in the parable, who said they would go, but in the end did not go. These were the very ones who were good at talking the talk but refuse to walk the walk. And then you have Jesus. He didn't spend his time with these religious leaders, with these phonies. He spent his time with sinners, tax collectors, prostitutes. He spent his time with people that were sick, who knew they were sick and confessed that they were sick. He spent time with those who, like the first son, had been openly and honestly and brazenly rebellious against God, against our Heavenly Father. But later, these folk had changed their ways. Later, these people had repented from their rebellion. And the fact that Jesus spent time with these sinners, rather than with the, with the religious leaders, drove those religious leaders nuts. But here's what's worse. The religious leaders had seen the changes in the lives of those sinners. They had seen how the tax collectors had stopped stealing money from people. They had seen how the prostitutes no longer sold themselves. They had seen how lives had been flipped upside down and right side up. They had seen the blind receive sight. They had seen the lame walk. They had seen the deaf hear. And then later, later, still, they did not repent and do the will of the Father through the Son. Friends, have you had your own later moment. That moment after the Lord calls you to do His will and you have to make a decision. And you come to that place where you are mired in your own sin, entangled in your own rebellion, held captive by your own desires. But now, later, you have chosen to live a life for God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I know that some of you have because I've heard your stories. I've heard the stories told that I've been through of this very thing. Many of you from different walks of life that have life and then at one time lived lives of sin and rebellion, but you had your labor. You had your change of heart. You had your changed heart. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. But still, there may be some here some watching on Facebook who have not had this moment of waiting that are still in their sin, that are still in open rebellion against God. Scripture teaches us that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. So friends, if that is you, then let today be your labor. Let today be the day that you change your ways, or rather the day where you surrender and let God and the Lord Jesus Christ change your ways, change your heart. Scripture tells us that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And friends, I think if we are really honest with ourselves, most of us are like that second son. Ways both big and small. 
you do? Like, have you had the moment when God has called you but have not yet done what he has asked? Are you merely a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word? Friends, let your labor be a labor of obedience. Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians wrote this. He says, you who began not only to do this, this word, but you also desired to do it, now finish doing it also, so that you may complete it according to your ability. Sisters and brothers, let, let obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ be your labor before it is too in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Friends, let us now approach the throne of grace on behalf of the church, the world, and one another. Let us pray. Most Holy Father, thank you for making us your children. Thank you for your patience with us when we speak and act in ways that grieve and displease you. Thank you for your son Jesus, who perfectly says and does your will. Make us to be like him, so that we are your heart's delight and your blessing to the world. Conform the church throughout the world to the mind of your dear son. Conform its proclamation and teaching to his own. Conform its works to his self-sacrificing love. Fashion the church into the image and likeness of Christ, into his very body, so that the light of his love shines into the world, and many turn to him and live. Grant strength, perseverance, and charity to our brethren who experience bitter persecution throughout the world. Stir up our hearts to defend and assist them. Soften the hearts of their tormentors so that repentance and true faith in you may grow. Put the mind of Christ into this congregation. Let his humility and self-giving love shape and direct our words, worship, service, and fellowship. Give us such willing hearts that we gladly speak and act in obedience to your will, to your glory, and for the building up of your people. Bless all parents, step-parents, and foster parents. Give them your spirit of wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, knowledge and fear of the Lord, and joy in your presence. Forgive their errors, relieve their fears, and grant them the joy of seeing their children grow into healthy, loving adults. Make the world's leaders, not only of nations, but also of local government and of all useful fields of human endeavor, into your wise and willing offspring. Teach them your will for guiding those for whom they are responsible. Keep in your special care those in the military and all who risk their lives for the sake of others. Inform their minds, strengthen their bodies, purify their hearts, shape their actions, and prosper all they do that is in accord with your will. Bring them home safely and soon and shield their loved ones with your love. Bring the joy of receiving help to everyone in distress, sorrow, danger, or need, including those whose names we bring to you now, either aloud with our lips or silently in our hearts. Lead them through the things that afflict and endanger them into the light of your blessed presence and into the joy of restored health, hope, and fellowship with those who love them. Conform our prayers to the heart of Jesus. Hear them through the interceding of your Holy Spirit and grant them in accordance with your gracious will. We pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, the one who taught us all how to pray, saying, Our Father. Trespasses. 
trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but the deliverance from evil. And I is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This will be the time normally, friends, when we would pass our offering plates around, but of course not doing that right now in this season of the church life together. Instead, there's an offering plate as you make your way out. There's also one by the old kitchen if you'd rather use that one. But I encourage you, if you've not done so already, to leave your tithes and gift your offering in the plate as you make your leave up. In anticipation of your gift, though, I want to offer to you these, this prayer. Let's pray. God of infinite patience. Just as Moses was worn down by the complaining of the Israelites, so you must tire as we pray for things we want and not the things we need. As we give our gifts to empower your church, help us to see the things that really matter, places where we can provide for others in need and deepen our trust in you to take care of us. This we pray in the name of Jesus, our rock and redeemer. Sisters and brothers, as we come to the end of our worship time together, we'll, we'll disperse like we've been doing. We'll start here, move here, then here, and then here. One thing I failed to point out is that for those that are joining us for charge conference tomorrow night, um, I have the, the paper versions of the order of the service, and they're over here on the piano. I email, email one out to you as well, but if you'd rather have one over the piano, they're, they're over here. Here now, my friends, I want to offer to you our word of benediction. So now we leave this space of worship. And while so much of the road ahead may seem uncertain, the path constantly changing, we know that some things that are as solid and sure as the ground beneath our feet and the sky above our heads. We know God is love. We know Christ's light endures. We know the Holy Spirit is here and found in the space between all things closer to us than our next breath, binding us to each other until we meet again. Go in peace now to love and serve the Lord.